So the title of tonight's talk is The Way to Heaven. And I know that many times when we have a talk such as this, the monks talk about you know, the way to find heaven in this life. And of course, uh, Chao Po has just explained some of the things, uh, some of the inspiring moments in life, the happy moments in life, which create a feeling of heaven in this very body and mind which you're sitting in now. But I think many of you would be more interested in the heaven which is after you die. <laughs> which is one of the reasons why you come here. Because one thing we can be sure about is that this life is going to end sometime. And you've uh, witnessed many other people dying. And because many of the people you've witnessed dying are your friends and your loved ones. It could be a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a husband, wife, people you really care about. And of course, if it's someone you really care about, you really wish them the very best. And you want them to have at least a good rebirth. So the idea of finding a good path to a happy rebirth, even to a heaven realm, is an important one, not just for ourselves, but because we care about others as well. And so, you know, first of all, that people do ask, you know, is there such a thing as a heaven or a hell? And I mentioned yesterday that my scientific background, and I still keep up with that science. And also to use that science, you don't need just to be uh, gullible, to be uh, someone who just believes in what you want to happen, to know that such a thing as life after death is a fact. There are many people who can remember their past lives. There are people who can remember the transition between lives. And there are people who have died and have been revived to come and tell the tale of what it's like. And I was always interested in those stories to see whether they match you know, what we have in traditional Buddhism about what happens you know, when you die. And not only that it matches the uh, teachings in the books, but also matches what you discover you know, when you practice your meditation to such a deep state. And there is a perfect match. Perfect match to the point that we can be sure what happens after death. And knowing what happens after death we can be sure that we can have a very, very good idea of what a heaven realm is and how to attain that heaven realm, if that is your aspiration. Now one of the things which the Buddha mentioned in the text was that when a person dies, they give up the coarse human body and they take up what we call a mind-made body, the Manomayakaya. And this is the experience of people who, either because they have very powerful memories of their previous lives, or more commonly, people who have what modern science calls NDEs, near-death experiences. And for those of you who want to check this out, these days it's so easy to just get on your computer, on the internet, on Google, and it's just three letters, N-D-E. And it's a huge amount of material, credible material, of people who describe what it's like to die and come back again. Now one of those stories, which I read a long time ago, and this is very important, especially if any of you here are in the medical profession. If you're surgeons or assistants who are in the operating theatres or the emergency rooms of our hospitals. Because this should give you a warning. There was one very wealthy woman in London who was having a very minor surgical procedure, but she required general anesthetic. Now because she was a wealthy woman, she 
hired a very famous surgeon and paid him a great deal of money for the operation. Now when you pay such a large amount of money to an expensive surgeon, you will discover he's always exceedingly polite to you. <laughs> However, during the operation there were complications. Sometimes these things happen and the complications were so severe that this lady died on the operating table. But only for a few minutes. And during those minutes that she died, she floated outside of her body, in the Buddha's mind-made body, where she could hear and see everything which was going on, as the doctors and nurses were trying desperately to revive her. And this surgeon, in the heat of the moment, in the panic of the crisis, he shouted out, Don't give up on me now, you bitch. <laughs> That's what he said. The problem was, he didn't realize that she was listening at the time. And they managed to revive her. They saw the problem and saved her life. But, when the doctor came around for the first post-operation visit, he was polite again. You know why? Because he hadn't received his payment yet. <laughs> he said, Madam, we came jolly close to losing you that time. Yes, she said, I know, but why did you call me a bitch? <laughs> and the doctor was stunned. You were dead at the time. How did you know that I called you that name? And she described everything which was happening. A perfect recall. Now the moral of that story, if you are at a traffic accident, if you are doing an operation, helping with an operation or working in the emergency room, be careful what you say. They could be listening and they will tell you afterwards if they get revived. <laughs> so just because they're dead, you don't know whether they're listening or not. So, when a person dies, we actually know they have this mind-made body. And there's been such a large amount of research done on this. And every two years I come here, I do mention the research of Professor Pim Van Lommel. And this is one of those great scientists who was an ordinary doctor working in Holland, in the Netherlands, in Europe. And as a doctor, he came across many people who claimed to remember this period when they were supposed to be dead. People who told him, yet yes, they were floating above their body in the operating table or in the emergency room, and they could hear and see everything which was being said. But this doctor, it was just an anecdote, it was just their story, it couldn't be proved. But he covered quite a few of those stories and later on in his career when he moved from being just a, a doctor in the hospital to a professor he decided to choose these experiences as a research project. So he decided to test out whether these so-called tales had any truth to them or not. And he chose three hospitals in the Netherlands and every patient who came into that hospital under cardiac arrest, or not so every, but all those who survived, he gave questionnaires to, to find out if any of those did have these experiences. And he was recording or taking notes of the procedures and conversations which happened around them, so that he could prove if they did remember that something was said or done, he could actually check to see if it was accurate, if such an event, such a speech, had actually occurred. And he think, did this research over two or three years. And when he looked at the results, 
he found yes, there was a lot of people, I think it was about 10% or 8% of the people who came in with cardiac arrest who survived had these near-death experiences. And what they remembered was said and happened was accurate. But what stunned him, the piece of evidence which he had never expected to find was that those 8 or 10% were those ones who not only had cardiac arrest but whose brains died. And he managed to see that these near-death experiences only happen when your brain stops functioning. That seems to be the point, the moment, when the mind separates from the body. And you have a mind-made body, at what we call brain death. And when that happens, it's common for the person, as we say, as they say, to float out of the body, being able to see and hear everything which is being going on, if they pay attention to it. Now the other interesting point of this, and which will come up afterwards when I talk about the nature of heaven, is that that experience is usually an extremely pleasant experience. Floating out of the body is one of the most joyful, physical experiences you've ever had. Going back to another story of an Australian politician who only recently retired from the Federal Senate, the Australian Senate in Canberra. And he was noted by the fact that as a politician he was always seen in a wheelchair. And the reason was that he was an Australian soldier during the Vietnam War. And during that conflict, unfortunately, he stepped on a landmine which blew off his legs. Now the interesting story is he's not a Buddhist, I don't think he's even a Christian, he's a free thinker as they say in Malaysia. The interesting part of that story about uh, this uh, story was he described what happened next after the explosion and the incredible pain of standing on a landmine. He said the pain was unbearable but only for a second. And the next thing he knew was that he was floating above the paddy fields of Vietnam without a care in the world. The most peaceful, blissful experience he'd ever known. He could see, he could hear, and he felt such ecstasy. And he said he did not know how long he was floating above his dead body when a thought came to his mind, and that thought was of his wife back in Perth, Australia. He's a local boy. And his wife had just given birth to their first child, a son. And he thought it's not right that he would abandon his wife and newly born child at this time. And just that one thought brought him back into his body. And as he entered his body again, the freedom, the bliss of this mind-made body totally disappeared, he had incredible pain again and fell into unconsciousness. And the next thing was waking up in the field hospital starting the surgical procedures to heal his broken legs. But the important point, he wasn't a Buddhist. I don't think he was even a Christian. He was just an ordinary person who described an event of what happens after death. Which again is exactly how we understand things to happen in the Buddhist way. And the important thing here is that it was a very peaceful and blissful experience. Now this is so common. Another story from a person who had one of these experiences, I think they were in hospital having an operation and they died out of their body. And they were having such a wonderful time and they met sort of so-called these guides, which are just a reflection of yourself, they're not real, but I'll go into that later on. They met one of these guides, and the guide said, you're not supposed to die, go back in your body. And she said, no. 
I don't want to go back in this body, it hurts. He said, you've got to. He said, no, I want to stay outside, it's much more fun. And they had an argument. They were in the operating theater, in these mind-made bodies, having an argument to go in and not to go in. And what happened next, she says, that this thing took hold of her and threw her into her body. And so she had to come back into her body and it really hurt. And she said in this interview, to this day, she will never forgive that spirit <laughs> for throwing her back into this terrible old body. Now, one of the reasons I tell these stories, not only because it gives you an idea of what happens to you when you die, but also to tell you that experience just after death is nearly always very, very pleasant. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that as soon as you leave this body and go into a mind-made body, you realize this physical body is a whole heap of suffering, as the Buddha said. And the mind-made body is far lighter, more free, and more peaceful, and more beautiful. Now, if you want to stay in that mind-made body, and actually take that into a longer type of existence, this is what we call a heavenly existence. To do that, as you see what happened to that Australian politician, just one thought of attachment, and he was back into his body. One negative thought, and you go into a lower realm. Higher thoughts, higher realms. So this is actually the time when it's not so much the last thoughts before you leave, but the thoughts which actually happen afterwards, in those first few seconds after you're dead. They're the ones which are really important. In one sense, these are your last thoughts before you take uh, a station in these new realms before you uh, get into those realms and stay there. But it's these thoughts which are most important. The way into heaven is having heavenly thoughts at that particular time. In other words, having a state of mind which will create those worlds. Because already I mentioned that in this particular body, it's called a mind-made body, it's not just the body which you make, afterwards it's the surroundings in which you are going to exist for a while. Yesterday I was talking about the power of the mind and how it is the maker and the creator, even in this coarse physical world. And that's even more the case in these realms after death, these subtle realms, especially the mind-made realms. Because sometimes when I read the descriptions of heavens in the different traditions, almost doing research, not just Buddhist heaven, but the Christian heaven, the Muslim heaven, and all these different types of heavens. I know this might be a generalization, but I remember sort of the idea of heaven in the English Bible was a place of beautiful sandy beaches and palm trees and nice and warm, just like Penang. <laughs> but when I started reading about the Islamic heavens, these were places of green fields and flowing water, just like England. And then I started getting really interested because some of my monks, there's a couple of monks back in Perth, are Norwegian. And I was asking them, in the Viking culture, what was their heaven like? And they described it. It's a place called Valhalla. And this is Viking heaven. Now remember the Vikings were very coarse people. Always loved fighting, drinking and eating. And that's what their heaven was like. In the description of their heaven, you, after you die, you wake up and you're at this big feast with everything you want to eat. And you eat and eat and also drink and drink. Alcohol, of course, because they were into that. And then you finish off, after you've eaten and drinking, with a fight. 
because they love fighting, you know, real fighting with swords. And once everybody gets killed in the fight, you wake up again on this big feast with lots of alcohol, knowing there's going to be a fight at the end, and that's your heaven, eating, drinking, and fighting. Now, is that real? Or is that what people who believe that that's what fun is, that that's what they create? Now, this might be, be controversial, but if you've got a son, maybe 10 or 11 years of age, who dies suddenly, but he's a good person, a kind person, a generous person, he's got lots of good karma, then he will might be reborn in the heaven of perpetual video games. <laughs> if that's what he likes, if that's what he thinks is fun, if that's one's idea of happiness, that's what you create in those realms. Because you have the karma, the mind is the creator, and these are the heaven realms which you make for yourself what you think is fun. Just like in this life, the sort of world you create for yourselves. I remember as a young man in London. You know, sometimes you go out with your friends you know, to a party, to a dance, or sometimes to a pub. I used to drink, but not drink that much. But some people would go to these pubs in London where there would always be a fight. They knew there was going to be a brawl after the they finished drinking. And I couldn't imagine, what do you do that for? Why do people go to a, a pub for a night out and know they're going to fight afterwards? Because some people like doing that. That is what they enjoy. What I think is just painful, frightening. Other people, they want to go to such places. Our mind creates those situations. If we like fighting, we'll get into fighting. If we like excitement, we get into excitement. If we like peace and meditation, we'll get to peace and meditation. You'll find that where you think happiness, contentment, fulfillment lies, that's where you incline, not just in this life, but in your next life. So the first thing is how you get to heaven is what do you think heaven is? Because what you think heaven is, if you have that idea of heaven, and you have the karma, that's where you'll go, to the heaven of perpetual fighting, if you like fighting. If you like a good argument, to the heaven of perpetual arguments. Is that what you like? Have a look. Have a look in the traditional descriptions of heaven in the Buddhist texts. Now some people think that these are fixed, this is what heaven is like, there can't be any, any, any other heavens. Now in those heavens, which you read about in the texts, you know, sometimes you've got like the heaven of the 33, and they're always having battles with the Asuras. And when I first saw that, that can't be a heaven going to battle, that's frightening. I don't want to go to heaven where I have to fight other people. But now you understand why, because there are certain types of people who love fighting. They sometimes go to boxing matches, and they, they love boxing matches. Even some Thai monks like that. This is my experience. When I was preparing to be a monk, this was 36 years ago, I was uh, staying in my mother's apartment in London, and the nearest temple was a Thai temple. And I was really keen, so I'd get up early every morning, about five o'clock, get on my motorbike. I had a motorbike at those days. Can you imagine me on a motorbike? Vroom, vroom. <laughs> I had a motorbike, I'd ride my motorbike to the Thai temple and get there about quarter to six for the morning chanting. I was really dead keen. I loved the morning chanting. I'd help the monks with their breakfast do any chores for them afterwards, and also go in the evening. But I'd always be there about quarter to six for the morning chanting. Sometimes the door was locked. Very often I had to wake them up. <laughs> I think 
They were very happy when I went to Thailand to become a monk because then they could sleep in. <laughs> I was that keen. And a lot of times, you know why? Because the poor Thai monks, especially the ones in that temple, the one thing they could not resist was the boxing. And if there was a boxing on the TV, they'd always stay up late watching the boxing. <laughs> it was Thai sport in those days. They're very kind monks, you shouldn't criticize them. But nevertheless, some people like sport and like violence. So sometimes people get reborn into that place. Sometimes in the other realms, you now they have these big palaces with like beautiful girls in every turret of the palace. Because sometimes people think having many, many wives is their idea of fun and joy. Many of you realize even having one wife is enough. <laughs> Imagine having 2,000. And what about the women? Where do they go? Do they go to the palaces where they have many men? <laughs> if that's what you like, that's what you get. Because you create those palaces. So the heaven realms are not just fixed by what we see in the suttas. In fact, when I remember reading those, the different levels of heaven realms, there was another heaven realm which was mentioned which didn't fit in. The heaven of the gods who play. The Kiddadevas. And actually, Kidda was playing. And that's how we get the English word, you know, to kid around. Exactly, this is where it comes from. So you've got the, de the, the, um, the devas, the heavenly beings who love playing around. And that's actually, you don't see that in the usual list of things. But it's in there in the suttas because the list of things is not definitive. And since that time, many other heaven realms have been created by you. That's why when I said the heaven realms are perpetual video games, I'm sure that that exists now. Because these are mind-made realms. Now first of all, you should see by this that because you're creating the heaven, you better be wise what you're creating. Because sometimes what you think is fun, like Valhalla, turns out to be not a heaven realm, but a hell realm. So have a good idea of what happiness, contentment, fun, truly is. Which is always why those higher heaven realms have got a much better idea of what happiness truly is. And it's not just sensual enjoyment like sex, video games, music and food. Because after a while, I mean these days, sometimes the, because of the progress in our societies and the wealth which we have created over the last hundred years, sometimes you can say that people almost live like Davis. Have you ever read the description of the Pure Lands? The Pure Lands, any music you want to hear, you just think about it and you can hear it. We have that now on the internet. Google Music, anything you want to hear, type it in and it's there for you. Any food you want to eat and it's there for you. Just go outside. You know, in Penang, there's Western food, Chinese food, Indian food. Anything you want to eat is there for you. Do you get the message? Penang is the pure land. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the old times people think is happiness. So right now you ask yourself, what do you think is happiness? When you die, what is it that you want? If you had now a, ch a chance to describe the heaven you want to go to after you die, what would you describe? Sometimes that might be a good exercise like in a Dharma class for children. You can make your own heaven when you die. What would it be? Now, once you start writing that down, describing the heaven of what you want it to be, then you start questioning it. 
Is that really as much as I want? Is that really heaven? Is that really going to make me happy? And after a while, you'll find, no, it doesn't. You create the heaven realm, but it's never going to be satisfying for you. Again, going back to the culture which I grew up in, which was a Christian culture, when I started looking at their descriptions of heaven, you know, it's people in white clothes who eat ambrosia and listen to harp music. That was supposed to be heaven. And when I first read that, white clothes, I had green velvet trousers. They were much more attractive than boring white clothes. And harp music, harp music wasn't fun. At that age, I preferred Jimi Hendrix. And as for food, ambrosia, I don't know how delicious it is, but after you have it morning, lunch, and night time for about 10 centuries, you get pretty fed up with ambrosia. There's other food I like to have. But his description of heaven didn't make any sense. But the description which I am telling you now, a mind-made realm with mind-made happiness, what you think is happiness, gives you much more understanding of what heaven is. And you are creating it. So before you die, please get a good understanding of what happiness truly is. What really is going to be satisfying. Because otherwise, when you get to your heaven, you'll be, be stuck with something you'll have to put up, for, up, up with for a long, long time, which isn't very happy at all. But, again, how do you get to such places? First of all, when you die, you have to have these beautiful thoughts. Why is it that those people who are even meditating can't make beautiful thoughts all the time? And sometimes you get negative thoughts. That yogi behind me, she's always making a lot of noise. And that other yogi, who's in my same dormitory. He gets up so early every day and he goes to bed later than I do. What does he think he is? The conceited up his own backside yogi. <laughs> so whatever it is, sometimes we get negative thoughts. Even now in a beautiful place. Now if you are someone who has negative thoughts now, how do you expect to have negative, uh, positive thoughts when you die? You're out of control. And sometimes silly little things upset you. So if you want to go to a good heaven realm, you better cultivate especially your thoughts to make them beautiful, positive. Otherwise, you won't be able to create a positive heaven realm for yourself, you create a very negative one. To give you an example, just an example, one of our monks, he was a German monk in Perth, and he got a book which is only available in German about, again, people who remember these intermediary experiences. They die, operating table, heart attack or whatever, and get revived and tell the tale of what happened to them in the time they were dead. And he pointed out one story, which was a fascinating story, of a young German boy who died. And he was revived and he told his story that he went walking a long way through a forest, because there's lots of forests in Germany, that's how he described it in his mind-made body until he came to a building, a very simple building, there was a person there and they asked him what his name was and they looked in some book or ledger these days he probably described it, he had a big computer and they typed in his name to see whether he was on the database or not but at that time, it was a while ago his name wasn't on the book so the person said, you're not supposed to die, go back but the person said, but since you've come all this way, hang around for a while and I'll show you how it works. And the next person who came was a German farmer. 
And the man said, what's your name? He said, your name's in here, yeah, you're supposed to die. Now I want to ask you some questions. This is actually the boy relating what he remembered. And the first question is, have you ever killed any animals? And the farmer said, oh, no, 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 maybe one or two, that's all. It's a farmer, you know, in Germany. Sausage makers. <laughs> and <laughs> this man turned around to the boy and said, this is amazing, isn't it? Even though he's dead, he still lies through his teeth. <laughs> and that's the negativity, because we're in denial of the truth. And with such negative mind, you can't even keep the precepts when you're dead. How on earth do you reckon you're going to make a heaven realm for yourself? But the n nicest part of this little anecdote was this boy said, the next thing he saw, he saw another guy and he went right past the shed. And he told the, the, the guy who's supposed to be checking everybody, he said, look, he's missing you, he's escaping, aren't you going to sort of ask him what he's done? And this um, man with the book said, see that guy over there? just passing by. Throughout his whole life, he's never judged anybody. Therefore, we're not going to judge him. And he saw this man just go up and up and up and up and up and up to a heaven realm. And I love that little anecdote because how accurate that is. A person who judges no one, who has this beautiful loving kindness, opening the door of your heart, no matter who they are, no matter what they do to you. If you don't judge others, you won't be judged yourself. In other words, that is the way of going to the heaven of no judgment. Now that's a fast way to heaven. The reason is, is because all the judgments which we make of other people, they're always negative usually. And it's also the way we judge ourselves negative. Which is why just before you die, one of the greatest things you can do or tell your loved ones to do is to do a ceremony of forgiveness. To let, uh, let go of all the past hurt, blame, guilt which you've done in the past. Because we've all got skeletons in our closet. We've all got things we'd rather have not done, and we did do. Usually small things, but we keep them, and we want to be punished for them. And if you have that mind we call guilt, you'll send yourself to a hell well. One story which really changed the way I looked at people. There was... Uh, an Australian nun staying at my monastery some years ago and she was doing a lot of meditation and she's a good meditator and she got to this stage you know which I've been talking to the meditators about of nimittas these beautiful lights in the mind and she was on the edge of getting into the jhana and I thought she's gonna make it but then she gave up and I said what's going on and she said, well, I got that beautiful nimitta. I knew I could go in to a jhana, but I decided I didn't deserve it. And I stopped. And I thought, that was so sad. But I realized that that's what happens to so many people, especially Westerners, but to an increasing degree, Asians as well. It's called guilt. And when we have guilt... Any, ask any psychologist, you will deny yourself happiness. You'll not only stop yourself going into the deepest meditations, but you'll also stop yourself going to a heaven realm. Why? Because you think you don't deserve it. You're creating your future life. And if you don't think you deserve happiness, you won't get happiness. There are such things as hell realms. And who creates those hell realms? You do. If you look at the temple paintings and drawings, if you look at the descriptions in the ancient texts, 
vats of boiling oil, demons with horns in their head poking you with big forks, razor trees to climb up. Gee, that was 25 centuries ago. Torture has improved since that time. They've got new and more sadistic ways of causing you pain. That's so old-fashioned that hell has improved in technology since that time. So basically, you create the hell which you think you deserve. Now, to tell you about the power of that positive thoughts and forgiveness, I remember going to see the great Buddhist temple of Borod Pudor in central Java many years ago. And I was uh, being taken around by a very wonderful monk, Venerable Panyawaro, who's got a, a temple just close by, Vihara Mendut. And that's where I stayed overnight. And the following day, he gave me a guided tour around Borod Pudor in central Java. And now he's an expert because he lives close by and he's a great Buddhist monk. And it was fascinating when he showed me all the carvings. But the one which I remember was on the bottom level, which depicts the hell realms. Because it was a story from the Jataka tales, which was uh, carved into that rock at the very bottom level of the, I think it's seven or eight levels of Bord Pudor. And this was a story of the man whose head was being cut with a razor wheel. Now I remember the story because this man, he was a merchant and you know, he made fortunes, lost fortunes, but one day when he was down, he was really upset and he was at home and he got angry with his mother and pushed her and she fell over and hurt herself. And the karma for that, because your mother and father, your parents are really, really important, what you do to them is karmically more potent than to any other person. So, except for you know, the Buddha and our huts and stuff. But your parents are really, really important. That's why we do have filial piety you know, in the Asian traditions. And it was in my English tradition when I grew up as well. So filial piety is not something specific to Asia. It used to be all through Europe until very recently when they lost it. But anyway, he pushed over his mother and she got hurt. And the karmic result of that, after he died, was he had to go to a hell realm. And in this hell realm, he met this guy whose head was being cut and cut and cut by this spinning razor wheel. And this man in agony said, I've been experiencing this extraordinary pain for 600 years. But I was told when I first came down here, in 600 years, another man will come who did what I did and hurt my mum. And he will take on that razor wheel and that's you, best of luck, mate. He didn't say best of luck, mate, I made that up. But immediately the razor wheel left this poor man who'd been tortured for 600 years. He'd done his karmic debt and went into this new man's head and cutting it like migraine a hundred times over. And as he was experiencing this pain, you know what he did? He had this amazing thought of compassion. It's such a terrible thing to do to hurt your mother. And it's such a terrible thing to, to receive the karmic consequence of this. And I don't want other people to receive this karmic consequence. So I will take on the karmic penalty of the next ten people. May this razor wheel cut my head for 6,000 years so other people will be free. And with that one thought of compassion, the razor wheel shattered and he was reborn immediately in the heaven realm. Now that was the old story and that's actually carved in rock. And when I saw that I thought, wow, that makes sense. It's your thoughts of kindness, the high-mindedness, the purity of your mind. That's what creates the heaven. It's your feeling of guilt and feeling you deserve to be punished. That creates the hell. And if there are any psychologists here, you would understand what I mean. The doors of hell are always open. You can walk out at any time you want. 
But a lot of people just can't do that. Because they haven't trained their mind in forgiveness. Which is why if you want to go to heaven, please forgive and let go of all of the bad karma you've done in the past. You can do that. Say sorry to the people you've hurt. Try and make amends if there's any possible way. An example of that, I think someone asked this question a few days ago in the question box. You girls who've had an abortion, and there's probably quite a few of you, because I know the statistics. So in here there'll be many women who've had abortions. Do you feel guilty? Do you feel that's a terrible thing which you've done and you need to be punished? If you did, when, if you think about that when you go, when you die, you will create a very bad rebirth for yourself. So before you get to that stage, if you still feel guilty about that thing which you've done, an abortion, the best thing to do is to do a forgiveness ceremony in front of a monk or in front of the Buddha statue in this temple or other stat temples whatever I have done by body, speech and mind is particular in causing this abortion I ask forgiveness and I give myself forgiveness because that's what the Buddha would always do the Buddha would say that acknowledging your mistake and seeking forgiveness is growth in the spiritual path that's all you need to do, you don't need punishment acknowledge and try and find strategies so you don't get yourself in that situation in the future. That's all that's needed. No punishment. That was one of the amazing things which I saw when I first became a Buddhist. As a Westerner, I, went, I learned religions which are all about punishment. If you do a sin, you get punished. And if you break the school rules, you get the punishment. But in Buddhism, there was no punishment. It was pure compassion and kindness. Look, punishment doesn't help anybody. Learn from your mistakes. Grow from them. Don't punish yourself because that just adds to the suffering in this world. It's called forgiveness. And to be able to forgive yourself and say, I did a bad thing. I forgive myself. I'm going to try to do better next time. And if you want to do some type of penance, not punishing yourself. As I said last night, if it's an abortion, make a donation to a children's home with children which don't have parents. You now a child almost had you as their parent, it seems to be the appropriate to help out in a children's home or whatever. To do something so that you don't need to feel guilty anymore. So you can let that one go. You men who've cheated on your wives, if you haven't made amends for that when you die, you will feel guilty too. And that might send you to a hell realm. So if you want to go to a heaven realm, say sorry. Make some sort of amends. Forgive yourself. Men are sometimes crazy especially when the blood goes to the bottom part and there's not enough left for their brain as they often say so forgive yourself and be careful make sure you have strategies so you don't do it again and then with that type of forgiveness that high mindedness yes, then you can go to heaven obviously the more you keep your precepts the more virtuous, virtuous you are the more generous and kind you are, the mind is more likely to have those beautiful thoughts after you die. You, know, you get attracted, inclined towards the heaven realms. And really, you have to do it. If you don't train your mind in positive, beautiful thoughts by forgiving your faults and by creating <coughs> positive mind states, inspiring, kind, compassionate ones, then you'll have a hard time getting to heaven. And even if all your children 
do all these ceremonies for you, praying and chanting and giving donations and transferring their merits. I don't know if you've heard this story, but this is from the sutras, the saying of the Buddha. He once told the monks, suppose you have a pot of ghee, like oil, and you break that clay pot of oil over a pond or lake. He said, the clay will go down to the bottom of the lake and the oil will float up on the surface. And suppose a monk comes along and does some chanting and makes a determination, oh, may the, the bits of clay float to the surface and the oil go down to the bottom. He said, would that monk be able to do that? No. He said, just like a person dies and they go down to the bottom or they float up to the top, all the chanting doesn't help. That was the word of the Buddha. I'd actually disagree with that unless I'm being pretty brave to disagree with the Sutta. Sometimes it does help just when they're on the edge of floating down or going to the top. It can give a tiny bit of a boost simply because when you are doing the chanting in that near-death experience which everybody has when they're dead they can listen, they can hear. But even better than chanting sutras or whatever is giving them a Dharma discourse. Something they can understand. Telling them about forgiveness, reminding them of their good qualities, inspiring them. Because you know what it's like, sometimes you hear an inspiring talk and you feel so happy, so uplifted, so wonderful. But actually, that's the best time to die. In about another hour's time, just when we finish. <laughs> it's true, just last about, when was it, about three or four months ago. In Perth, I'd just given a talk and just finished off, it was a really nice talk, and this man came to ask me a question and had a heart attack right in front of me and died. Wow, he was so lucky. <laughs> it's true, he died right in front of me. Just after a nice talk. Now that's the sort of guy who would, yeah, he's got no, no other alternative, has to go to a heaven realm. Because he's inspired. So if you are really feeling very sick, you know, especially tomorrow night or the next night or the night afterwards, <laughs> come up and listen to the talk. If you are going to die, this is best time. But to be able to get the inspiration, when a person dies, if they can get something which is very, very beautiful and inspiring for them, because again, as I said the other night, two nights ago, all those chantings, they were actually teachings of the Buddha, which were powerful teachings of the Buddha. And the monks would, or the, everybody would understand them in those days. So if it's an inspiring sutra or an inspiring sort of Dharma talk, play that to them at the funeral. So they can hear the Dharma and get inspired. Forgive all their thoughts and have these beautiful ideas in their head. And that will take them off to a heaven. That can help. And all the donations you give to other people. Look, the law of karma is a law. It doesn't admit to any bribery or corruption. Just you might know a great monk and say, Ajahn Brahm, you know, here's a donation to your monastery. Can you do something about my father? He was always getting drunk and sleeping around with other women. Can, can you do something for him, please? Of course you can't. I can't mess around with somebody else's karma. So the point is that number one, you create your heaven or you can sometimes create a hell. It's in the power of your mind. So please train your mind, inspire your mind. Have a mind which uh, can develop positive thoughts and can forgive the past bad thoughts. And you'll understand that if you can do things like that, you're increasing your chances so much 
that yeah, you will be able to go to a heaven realm, a nice heaven realm, have a break for a while, and then come back to earth afterwards, a new life to carry on. You create your world. You create the next world too. It's up to you what you want to create. So don't just think, ah, oh, coming to the temple, just need to give a donation and then you'll be fine. Sorry, not enough. <laughs> you have to start keeping those precepts, training your mind, being a good, virtuous, kind person. And then you have such a beautiful mind, those thoughts at the end of your life would also be beautiful. And beautiful people go to beautiful places. But make sure you create a truly beautiful place and not a second-rate place. Thank you for listening. Okay, is there any questions so far on the talk which I've just given? Okay, we'll those the questions in the boxes, heaps of those. Dear Ajahn Brahm, as, I've, as we are entering the sixth day of this retreat, some yogis might have forgotten a few basic rules. Can you please remind them to keep the noise level down, e.g. the plastic noise, walking, opening and closing doors, etc., especially when yogis are sleeping, which is most of the day. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Yeah, come on, be kind to each other. So when you are sort of making little noise, it also means you're being mindful and kind. So don't slam the doors, don't rustle the plastic, don't burp, <laughs> whatever else it is. Try, remember what I said the first night, try being like burglar. Like a burglar being able to walk into the room and no one actually sees. Actually, we did have a burglar. Maybe I shouldn't train, I shouldn't mention that. <laughs> you know what I mean. Try and be very calm and very, very peaceful. That burglar who came in, they didn't disturb anybody. So I think they're probably better meditators than you guys are. <laughs> no, so be very quiet. But if they do make a noise, what should, how should you respond? Remember what Ajahn Chah said? It's not the noise that disturbs you, it's you who disturb the noise. So they slam the door and that's over in a second. But if you start to think, why did they slam the door? How many times do we need to tell people to be quiet? They're just awful. Maybe I'm going to tell Ajahn Brahm their name so they can never come on a retreat again and already the noise has lasted another one minute. So every time you complain about it, you are making more noise. That's what he meant by don't disturb the noise. The noise is over in a second. But your thinking can carry on all day. Sometimes we know someone who asks for charitable donations are not genuine. We are in a dilemma. If we donate, we may continue to support them and deceiving people. If we don't donate, we feel very pitiful on them. Please advise the right teaching. I remember just when I was a student at Cambridge, there was always a few people who were asking for money. And somebody once, I was actually just going off to get myself some fish and chips for, for my evening meal. And I passed this guy and he said, can you give me some money, I'm hungry. And I said, wait for a moment. And I came back and got some fish and chips for him as well. And he was really upset at me, because he wasn't hungry, he just wanted the money to buy some booze, some liquor. So you can always be careful with your donations. When we went to India, many of you have been on pilgrimage to India, we were told by the organizers of the pilgrimage, don't give any money or things to the beggars. And of course, one person just decided, no, they were going to give something to a beggar. And it was a terrible thing to see. There was a little girl. Now, she probably looked like a six-year-old. She was probably about 12 or 13. And this woman on my trip threw out a piece of clothing to her. Her smile lasted only for about a second. As soon as she received that piece of clothing, all the other beggars jumped on her, beat her, and tore all of that clothing away. And after about two or three minutes, she saw this poor girl with just a scrap of clothing and all bruised and crying. It was just so sad. 
look, if you're going to be kind, be wise as well. So we're told, look, don't give it to just you know, anyone. You know, give it to the orphanage, give it to the charity. I know the Mahabodhi Society over in Bodh Gaya does a lot of charitable work. Or if we were going to give anything to the beggars, we actually got the bus driver to line them up and he had a big stick. He had to, to order them. And he put them all in line and if anybody misbehaved he would whack them. And then he would give them something each. Otherwise it would be just a free fall and everyone would get hurt. So it's the same when you give a charitable donation to someone which is not genuine. There's so many other genuine charities around. So please choose the one which are genuine, which are really going to, to do something worthwhile for the local community. And then it's doing the best. This human world is heaven to me. How for what to do to ensure that I come back to this world. Okay, it may be heaven for you now, but as you get older, you're going to start to ache and hurt. I don't know how old you are now, but you've got away with it so far, but your luck is running out. <laughs> you see the old people, they can hardly walk, they've got arthritis and pains. I've often noticed this with old people, they can't walk, their legs are weak, their arms are weak, you know, they can hardly write, their eyes start to fade, their hearing starts to go. But there's one part of an old person which gets stronger every year, and that is their mouth. <laughs> old people can really talk and talk and talk. Everything else gets weak, but the mouth gets stronger and stronger. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to get reborn as a human being, is that really what you want to be reborn as? You know there has been, these are other little stories, I've got time. There have been some people, I've collected stories of people who have talked when they were born. The first time this happened was back in Perth, and this couple came to see us. They were Australian couple, couple, they weren't Buddhists, but they had their second child recently. One was called Peter, the other one was called Paul. The eldest one was called Peter. And it, I don't know what time it was, and the parents said, Peter, go and say goodnight to your baby, your baby brother, Paul. Only about five or six or seven days old or something. And so Peter went up to the... Um, what's it called, the stroller, whatever, where the baby was in. He leant over to his little baby brother and said, good night, Paul. Um, so, and, uh, so to his, that's right, good night, Paul. And Paul said, good night, Peter. <laughs> and the parents thought, did we hear this? Was this true? They couldn't believe what they heard. So they stopped what they were doing and they stared and their elder son was about two or three years of age. Obliged, without them asking, he said a second time, Good night, Paul. And this time they were paying full attention. And their little baby said, Good night, Peter. And that's why they were so surprised they came to see the Buddhist monks. They said, What's going on? He said, It's obvious, you know, he spoke. You know, it's just, he's just been reborn probably from a human realm, and actually the strange thing was that he did speak like in an adult voice, not a baby voice. And that was one case, and there was another case, of a, it was actually a Malaysian couple in Perth. And they told me they never told anybody this because they thought that they would be uh, thought of as crazy if they said that their newly born baby had spoken. But the best of all was in the United States in a maternity ward and the baby had just come out of the mother's womb and everybody heard it and saw it. The baby just out of the mother's womb turned around and said, oh no, not again. <laughs> and that's true, he said, oh no, not again. Now that was a wise being. 
Do you want to be a baby again? Having to wear nappies, having every time you want to say something, your mother putting this thing in your mouth. Having to go to school again, go to kindy again, being naughty, getting the cane again in Malaysia. Do you want to go through all that again? Is that what you really want? If you think that's heaven, that's what you'll get. <laughs> Be careful what you think happiness is. What does a deva look like? Earth deva, heavenly deva. As you expect, because these are mind-made beings. So which is why, if you see a heavenly being and they're from, say, England, they'll have wings on their back. Because that's what angels are supposed to have. If you see one in Thailand, they've got these funny hats, you know, the big spiky hats on the top. If you see one in Penang, they're just, I'm not quite sure. What do you think they always look like? <laughs> just brilliant and, and shining. Because, because these are mind-made beings, they're as you expect them to be. That's how they look. They're created by the mind. And that's how they would look to you. Next question. My grandfather, who passed away many years ago, was believed to have visited my sister when she gave birth to her first child, a son. Same for my cousin's wife, who had a... So a visitation by his mother who came to see her grandchild had passed on. Her spirit was seen by the lady taking care of mother and child. Should it be a concern that both have not reincarnated despite passing on many years ago? What causes them to stay on? Okay, now, that could have been, that, especially the first case, as a grandfather died many years ago and you are visited by your and was believed to have visited my sister when she gave birth to her first child, a son, sounds to me that that son could be the grandfather reincarnated. Because that actually happens. So if, like, you know, you're about to give birth and you uh, get a visitation or you see or feel uh, one of these relation, relations who died many years ago, the chances are that that means that's a sign that that baby coming out of your womb is a reincarnation of that person. I know that happened to one of the Buddhists over in Sydney. He had an auntie uh, who was, uh, never got married. She was a very successful businesswoman and she died eventually. And a few months later, his wife became pregnant and when she gave birth, as usual, all the family come and see the new child and everybody started saying, oh, she looks just like your auntie. And of course, when she started speaking, it was clear it was the auntie. Now he'd inherited, he told me this story, he inherited one of her auntie's coffee cups. And when he came in the room with a cup of coffee, the little daughter went ballistic. Daddy, that's my coffee cup, give me my cup back. When they went past the mansion where she used to stay, Daddy, take me back home to my mansion. I want to go back to my mansion. The most funny part of the story was as a businesswoman, one of the things she hated was paying tax. <laughs> and it was a thing about her. She'd do anything to avoid paying tax to the government. And he said one day, he was driving his little girl in the car, and they went past one of these billboards, one of these big advertisements by the side of the road which was advertising a new Australian tax. And she turned around, Daddy, what does tax mean? And Daddy had to explain to like a five or six year old, or no, three or four year old, you know, what tax means. And so he said, well, darling, if ever I give you any pocket money, then some of that has to go to government. And the little girl said, Daddy, no way am I going to give any of my money to any government. <laughs> She still had the tendency which she had before. That was the auntie reborn. And you can see why it happens. Because your family members, you're very close to these are the people you love and care for. And so if there's like a, a room vacant, 
you know, one of your family members gets pregnant, of course you'll be a, they'll be attracted to get reborn into you. So very often, the people we give birth to are past family members. Because we've been close before, we're close next. So that's quite likely that could have been the grandfather being reincarnated as your son. You mentioned if we feel guilty, then we go to a bad realm. What about people that do bad but don't feel guilt? People who do bad do feel guilt, but they don't admit it. And when I used to go to prisons and visiting the people in jail, when you first go there, these Australian men, for the most part, put on this face of bravado. I'm innocent, I haven't done anything. But when you get to know them, and they get to trust you, you get to trust them. Every one of them said pretty much the same thing. There's never a day goes by when they don't regret terribly what they've done. They do have guilt. I've never met anyone in those jails who doesn't have guilt big time. Only they usually don't admit it to other people. So those people you think are bad people and you think they don't have any guilt, I would assure you they do have guilt. Only a lot of times they don't show it because they're scared of it. They don't admit it because it's so painful for them. But it's there, for sure. Next question. Can you compare and contrast between Buddhism and Hinduism since both originated from India? Is a conflict in Sri Lanka a religious base, one between the Hindus and the Buddhists? Now, the conflict in Sri Lanka was never sort of a religious base. While even Prabhakaran, the leader of the Tamil Tigers, was a Catholic. And many Tamils, Tamil Hindus, were in the, um, the Sri Lankan government. So it was a racial um, war. And it was only between a part of the uh, Tamil Hindu com community in uh, Sri Lanka. So it's like a racial thing, not a sort of uh, a religious thing. And the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, both believe in karma, uh, both have the meditation, but it's a Buddhism which goes more to an emptiness, to a nothingness, rather than to a God. That's a big question, and you know, you can f of all those religions, Hinduism and Buddhism are quite close together. So a lot of times the Hindus and Buddhists can get on very well together. They're much closer, Hindus and Buddhists, than uh, so the, the Christians and the Buddhists say. We're much closer together. Is, if, is Buddhism a religion by true definition of the term, since there is uh, in belief of the existence of a one God creator? When I'm asked that question in Australia, I say Buddhism is a religion for tax purposes only. But actually that debate, a debate was held in the House of Lords in London maybe about 20, 25 years ago, or maybe even earlier than that, because the law lords in UK wanted to find out what it means by the word religion. And they had a very high power debate and they decided that before that debate, one of the uh, vital requirements for being a religion is to believe in a creator God. But they thought that Buddhism certainly does not hold that there's a creator God, but has so many other characteristics which are recognized by many as religious that they decided, yes, Buddhism is a religion, and thereby they changed the meaning of religion to include Buddhists. And so these terms which we have in any language are always able to be changed to fit the current reality. And so that these great professors and scholars and wise people in the House of Lords, they did say, yes, Buddhism is a religion, even though it doesn't believe in a god. So these days, a religion is not necessarily mean you have a belief in a god. 
Why sometimes when I meet someone who I don't know before but I just feel that I don't like this person? Had this person done something bad on me in the previous life until I still don't like this person in this life? For example, when my neighbor moved in, I just felt I don't like him with no reason. Please help to clear my doubts. Thank you. Well, it could be that, you know, that was your husband in the previous life. <laughs> but it's more likely that you know, it's just sometimes we see something and we just don't like it and later on they become your best friends. Have you ever had that experience? Sometimes you see someone you just don't like them. When you get to know them, they're such a wonderful person, they become really good friends afterwards. So a lot of times it's just, you know, just perceptions. You may be in a bad mood that day or may remind you of somebody you don't like. So the chances are that it was someone from a past life is very very light, very low. It is understood that we need to respect and be filial to our parents. What if the parent is doing something bad on a child? He, for example, break off the signs of marriage intentionally or asking the child to do the wrong things. In this case, if the child decides to ignore the, what the parent wants, the parent feels hurt. Would it be bad karma to the child because of disobeyed to the parent in doing the wrong things? You may know that one of the most famous pe people who disobeyed his parents was the Buddha. Now he ran away from home. So it is, what we say in Buddhism, the parents are very weighty beings. So actually the word to respect in Pali is garu karoti, which means to make them heavy. What that means is what your parents say is more weighty, you give it more importance than to say what your friend says. But it doesn't mean that their words are so weighty that they can't be outweighed by other things. So fulfill your piety, you listen to your parents and what they say you take great notice of and you give it much more importance than other people say. But if you think of for yourself and you ask many other people and you find that most other people disagree with your parents, then when you put it in the balance, other people's ideas and views can outweigh your parents and you can disregard what they say. So it can be done, but you have to be very careful that you have enough to outweigh the very, very he heavy or uh, very weighty advice of your parents. And your parents shouldn't really feel hurt because you're trying to do the very, very best. And sometimes parents do get it wrong. And the parents should understand that. But the children should listen to their uh, parents because what they say is likely to be, be right, but not always right. So don't ignore everything your parents say. So most of it, take on board. But every now and again there may be a few things which you have to make your own decision. And then I think your parents will respect you and they won't feel hurt if you become a happy person. That makes sense? Hypnosis. What is Buddhism's Ajahn's views towards hypnosis? I'll tell a little story for you. Once there was a temple in Malaysia and the priest there, he was a very good priest, but he was very, having a hard time getting enough donations in the box. No, he, he couldn't pay the bills. So, he went to see another Buddhist priest who'd been a priest for much longer. And he said, how, how can I solve this problem? And the priest said, it's very easy. Next time you give a sermon in the temple, turn up the heater. Put off all the air con so it's very, very hot and give a very boring sermon. 
in a monotone like this so after a few minutes everybody falls asleep but just before they fall asleep take out your watch and swing it backwards and forwards and hypnotize everybody and once they're hypnotized you tell them no coins in the donation box only 50 ringgit notes, 100 ringgit notes, nothing smaller. And the priest said, I can't do that, that's fraud. It's not fraud, it's encouraging people to make good karma. He says, is it okay? He said, yes, okay, I'll do that. So the next time there was a sermon, he turned off all the fans, turned off the air con, and made it very hot. And he gave a really boring sermon. And when everyone was about to fall asleep, he got out his watch, backwards and forwards, and he hypnotized the whole audience and said, 100 ringgit notes, 50 ringgit notes, nothing smaller, no coins. And when he took them out of hypnosis and they went home, the donation box was full. He made a fortune that evening. But he thought, if I do this every evening, they'll find out. So he waited until he needed some money to pay the bills and he tried it again. He turned out, off all of the fans and the air con. He gave a boring sermon when everyone was about to fall asleep. He got out his watch, was just about to hypnotize them. Actually, he did hypnotize them, but then he dropped his watch and it broke. And he said, shit. <laughs> and it took them a whole week to clean up the temple <laughs> so that's why we don't do hypnosis but hypnosis like anything else it can be a good thing to do it works really really well on some uh, like addictions people have so yeah, it can sometimes work. It can reveal, sometimes can reveal past lives. But sometimes it's uncertain. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with hypnosis. But don't do it to raise funds for your temple. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, certain religions preach that if you believe in that particular religion, you are guaranteed of a place of heaven. Is this true in your opinion? Of course it's not true. Just belief is never enough to go to heaven. It's what you do, how you practice. So just thinking, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Buddha, I believe in whatever, is nowhere near enough. Simply because just belief in things, sometimes people practice very, very bad things. Take Adolf Hitler. He was a Catholic. Himmler. He was the head of the SS. He was a very strong Catholic. He believed in Jesus. Do you think they'd go to heaven? Of course not. There are many, many terrible people who have believed in a religion. Just because you believe in a religion does not mean you go to heaven. It's what you do. So, the 9-11 bombers, do you think they go to heaven? No, no way. It's what you do. If you've got a mind of killing people and destroying people, no way can you go to heaven like that. It's what you do it means you go to heaven or not. You ask any people who've been to heaven and know how to get in, know the entry requirements, because you can go, you can come back again. It's your goodness, your kindness, your virtue. These are the places, these are the characteristics which make you belong in heaven. Dear Ajahn, kindly comment on this unique photograph taken by US Air Force recently. What's this one? Don't know what it is. Taken by US Air Force, surely no dust on the lens. Could be anything, I don't know what that means. Anyway, Kuan Yin is a big thing in Penang. What's Kuan Yin's place in Theravada tradition? 
I can't really make this photo out, but like many things, if you have a photo, if you have like a cloud formation or anything else, people can see all sorts of things. In psychology, they use that uh, ink blot where they take an ink blot, they fold it in half and they open it up and they give it to you and say, what do you see? And psychologists use this because it says more about you than what's actually in the ink blot. If you believe this is Kuan Yin, then you'll say it's Kuan Yin. If you believe it's uh, a dust particle, it's a dust particle. If you believe it's a Statue of Liberty, it's a Statue of Liberty. So a lot of time it's one's beliefs. I remember as a kid, there was a time when you'd have like the melting snow in London and people would see Jesus in the melting snow. And for me it was just lions and whatever. So what you add on to these pictures is more, is more revealing than actually what's in them. It's how you perceive it. So this one over here that people think that is Kuan Yin, it's just a picture to me. But anyway, the place of Kuan Yin, sort of in Theravada Buddhism, it's fascinating. For those of you who know the history of Kuan Yin, Kuan Yin, or Avalokitesvara, was one of the two uh, main disciples of Amitabha. Just like the Buddha Gautama had Sariputra Moggallana, the Amitabha had Avalokitesvara, and the other one was Vayama. These were supposed to be the two chief disciples of Amitabha when, they become a, when Amitabha becomes a Buddha. Just like Sariputra Moggallana, two main disciples of Buddha Gautama. And that's what it started off as. Amitabha, a future Buddha, and Avalokitesvara and Vayama will be the two chief disciples. Now, Vayama effort never really took off. It was not as easy to market as a god of compassion, Avalokitesvara. So in the history of Buddhism, Avalokitesvara became very well known and very popular, but Vayama just effort just faded away. And in the early pictures of Avalokitesvara, just as you would expect, it was a man. But when it went to China, it had a sex change and became a girl. And so now Avalokitesvara is regarded as a female, a goddess of mercy. Now that's the history of Avalokitesvara, Canon or Kuan Yin. However, that's all by the by because whatever you want Kuan Yin to be, that will be for you. Remember, much of this is mind-made stuff. So because of the power of the mind, if you want to see Kuan Yin, you can. In the same way a person can see Jesus, or they can see the Virgin Mary, or sometimes people can see Arahats. These are all mind-made visions you make them, you create them. They are not outside of you. Nevertheless, they can be useful for you. If you can create a vision of Kuan Yin, as long as you make use of it as a very inspiring uh, object to make you more compassionate, then it works. Anyway, you can have a look at this later on, see what you think. Years ago in my dream, my grandmother advised me to go and see a doctor and all would be well. The next day I had an orange urine. I remember my grandmother's advice and visited a doctor. In the end she was right. Well, she tried to help, comfort and protect me from the other world. Thank you. Yeah, that actually can happen. That sometimes we have dreams uh, uh, of deceased relations who tell us to actually to do something. And sometimes you know, they are helping us. So that could be the case. Sometimes you can experience Kuan Yin coming down to help you. Is it Kuan Yin? Exactly what is it? Is it your grandmother, your grandfather? Sometimes it doesn't matter as long as you get healed. But sometimes it could be a relation who comes down to help and assist you in times of great difficulty. That certainly I've seen evidence of that. There was one of uh, my disciples in Perth, she was 
bringing food to our monastery where I live, which is one hour from the city. So she'd promised to come and bring food that day for the monks, but in her business, it was very, very busy, she got a, a special order in, and she had to stay up all night packing the order. But because she was a Thai girl, she said, I'd promised to go to the temple, I have to go. So even though she hadn't slept all night, she cooked some food, put it in the car, and started driving to the temple. It's a very dangerous thing to do, to drive when you're so tired. She fell asleep at the wheel. And as she was asleep at the wheel, she said she felt somebody slap her on the face. Really hard. It woke her up, and she had strayed to the opposite side of the road, and there was a truck coming right in her direction. Because she was woken up, she had time to swerve back into the correct lane and avoid a head-on collision. It saved her life. And it happened two more times before she reached the monastery. And there was no one in the car with her. It's obviously that some being was trying to keep her alive. So she could actually get to the monastery and give food to the monks. And I said, yeah, that happens. If you're about to do something good, then these beings will come and help you. But I said, if you were driving to the casino, no way would they wake you up. <laughs> so yeah, that could be your grandmother helping you. Ajahn, I like a boy. He is not Buddhist. He is not a bad guy, but he doesn't show much of kindness and compassion. You might like him now, but will you like him later if he's not kind and compassionate? So, if you really, really like him, send him some CDs on how to be kind, how to be compassionate, and see if you can change the guy. If you can't change him, give up. <laughs> he may look nice, you may like him, but gee, you're going to have to put up with this guy. And especially if you marry him, you have to put out with him for 30, 40 years. And if he's not kind and compassionate, you're going to have a really, really hard time. So remember, what do you like about the boy anyway, or about the girl? Find out something which is going to last a long time, not just something which you might like, which just doesn't last very long. Diraja, what do you think about the end of our world? Will it be year 2012? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think, what year is it? 2010, no, nine now. So I'll be coming in 2011 to a long retreat and 2013. I promise I'll be here in 2013 to give another retreat. <laughs> no, it's never going to... This has been going on for such a long time. You know, it first started the year 1000, no, actually even before then. Because the Christians, actually the Jesus said that. He said, the, uh, the world will end before uh, all of us, present there, disciples, had traveled the whole uh, part of Palestine. Basically, people were thinking it was going to end in their lifetime. It never did. The next time, 1000. People left their villages in Europe at the end of the year 1000 because they thought definitely the, earth, the world's going to end. And then what it was is 1999, Nostradamus said 1999, it still didn't end. Then they had Y2K and that didn't end. Promises, promises, promises. People who have these end of the world never keep their promises. Ask those people who believe that the world's going to end in 2012 and I'm sure you'll find they have investments which go way beyond that. They have uh, insurance policies and mortgages and plans for their kids which go way beyond that. If the world's going to end in 2012, why put your th kids through school? Ask those people who believe their kids are still in school. Or if you really want the killer, you make a bet with them. 
make it big, 10,000, no, 100,000 ringgit, let's go for big time. 100,000 ringgit. If you think the world is going to end in 2012, I will take you on. 100,000 ringgit. If the world doesn't end in 2012, you have to pay me 100,000 ringgit. If the world does end in 2012, I'll pay you 100,000 ringgit. <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> of course not. There are a lot of unexpected natural phenomena happened recently. Even the scientists themselves had they haven't had proof their predictions. I am so worried that while the world will be ended within three years, a lot of religious have predicted that it will end in the year two thousand and twelve. No way. And you ask if it's those other religions, so forget about money, if it doesn't end in 2012, and you're wrong, you have to convert to being a Buddhist. Because <laughs> we say it's not going to end in 2012. So no, please don't sort of be gullible, it's not going to end in 2012. Dear Ajahn, will we regress if we don't practice meditation persistently even though we already obtained jhana? Yeah, you can go backwards, but you can't go backwards that far. Somebody once told me, this was an Australian guy, he said, once you've heard these teachings of Buddhism, you just can't forget them. He said he tried to forget them and do other things, but he just can't, he had to keep coming back. Once you've tasted peace, real peace of mind, real kindness, you're addicted. You become, like some of you, Dharma junkie. <laughs> Always want to hear some more good Dharma. This is good junkie, good addiction. It's addiction to being good, to being kind, being compassionate, being peaceful. So once actually a person tastes freedom, they will never be able to ignore it again. So you may regress, but you always have to come back again. Oh, two questions. One. Greetings, Venerable Ajahn. Is an Arahat the same as a Buddha in terms of the way to gain success, the purity, pureness, characteristics, capabilities, etc.? Their wisdom is the same, their attainments are the same. Sometimes their other abilities like psychic powers can be different. But basically, in the most important areas, they are the same. Sometimes I like to say a Buddha is like the first Arahat in the sequence. And all the other arahats are pretty much the same as the Buddha, only the Buddha was the first who started teaching. There was another question in the back, sorry. And when one dies, if she or he, sorry, it, when one dies, if he, she, or even it don't come back in any form to the family, close friends, can this be considered he, she, it has already taken rebirth in the human realm already? Because a ghost will come asking for merits, a deva will come say hello. Is this <laughs> correct understanding about taking rebirth after death? Now, not always will people come and say hello or revisit. Sometimes, if they get reborn in the heaven realm, they're having too good a time. Have you ever had a child who goes over to university in the United States? They don't write to you. You say, "Son, daughter, why didn't you write or call? We're having too good a time, mum." Sometimes that's what happens in the Deva realm. It's too good a time. They don't come and visit you when they're having so much fun. And if it's in the hell realms, it's like going to jail. You're not allowed to call. <laughs> so sometimes, just because they haven't seen or heard of them doesn't mean sort of they haven't taken rebirth. Well, they have taken rebirth. There's many, many other possibilities. Hi. Dear Ajahn, is jhana transferable to the next life? They say, nothing is transferable to your next life except karma. Now sometimes to raise a bit of extra money for my society, the Buddhist Society of West Australia, we already have life memberships. I was thinking of having many life memberships of our society. <laughs> is that a good idea, do you think? No, it's fraud. You can't have many life memberships. So your karma, your tendencies will be transferred to your next life. So if you've got that deep meditation of jhana in this life, the chances are you'll incline to it in another life. 
I know there's many people I've known who are almost automatically, just by chance, they get into these jhanas at the weirdest of times when they're just an ordinary person. They may be sitting around a lake or around their house and their mind gets deep into these jhanas. But so many people I've known have done this and they haven't had any instructions, they don't know how to meditate. To me it's almost certain that they did these jhanas in a pre <laughs> previous life and the mind recognizes and it becomes like an automatic. But sometimes so they don't know what happened and sometimes it's great to be able to see a monk who knows what they're talking about to explain what happened to them. So they know, ah, that's what I experienced. And sometimes that is, I think, the case. They experience things, these states in a previous life. Next question, I'm a very lousy meditator. I always fall into a daze every time I meditate and end up feeling hopeless. What should I do? I haven't told this story this time. But once the Buddha was walking with his attendant Ananda through the forest, and there they saw this monk sitting perfectly straight with a beautiful posture. Don't have to sit up straight yourself. Beautiful posture, the left hand over the right hand, the thumb slightly touching, the, the chin tucked in, perfectly straight back, meditating. And the Buddha turned around to his attendant Ananda and said, I'm worried about him. And two weeks later, that monk disrobed and got married. The Buddha was right. And then the same day, deeper in the forest, he saw another monk meditating. His back bent, nodding and nodding and nodding. And the Buddha turned to Ananda and smiled and said, I'm not worried about him. And a couple of weeks later, he was fully enlightened with all the psychic powers. I don't know who answered that question, but maybe in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> now the interesting thing was, why? Because when I read that, I thought, that doesn't make any sense at all. Until I realized what the Buddha was saying. That first monk, totally straight, perfect posture, was a control freak. You can hold your body straight, you can watch the breath out of force of will. And that does not lead you to peace of mind. The other monk, he was letting go. And it was only a matter of time, as I've told you here. If you just make peace, be kind, be gentle with your doziness. After a while it vanishes. If you fight it, it lasts. And he made peace with it. And after a while it vanished. And he had remained with that peace enough to take him into the deepest meditations, enlightened with psychic powers. So, if you're dozy, well done! <laughs> you're being peaceful, and you're not being mindful enough to appreciate that peacefulness. Just stay there, don't fight, don't think you're lousy. In fact, the people who are dozy meditators are far less trouble than those who can't stop thinking. Those who can't stop thinking, they're the hard nuts. They're, they're difficult to teach. The dozy people are easy to teach. Ajahn, regarding about donation, is the correct way to give donation to monks in the form of red packets? Thank you. It's much better to give donations to temples or monasteries rather than the monks. Because sometimes the monks get really wealthy. And do you like having wealthy monks? Is that what a monk should be? So we try, in our tradition, the forest tradition, never to give any money to the monks. I don't have any money. I don't have a credit card. I don't have a bank account. I don't have any cash. I'm totally penniless. And I do very well. Wherever I am, there's always someone to feed me. I've got a few robes. If I have to go anywhere, someone buys me the ticket. If they don't buy the ticket, I don't go anywhere. So that way, I've lived 35 years without any money. And that inspires people. And especially, don't give red packets 
to monks who walk down the street because very often they're fake monks. If you see monks walking on the street with a bowl, give them some food, not money. Because otherwise we have these you know, fake monks who go around Singapore you know, they're just trying to get money and they're not real monks. So the best thing, especially monks of my tradition, don't give them red packets. If you want to give a donation, give it to their monastery, their temple or their retreat center or whatever. Because I don't need anything. So that's the best way. My relative, who is a doctor and who meditates, told me she has this fear of being buried alive in a coffin. Is it possible? Even though the person is certified dead by a doctor. No, it's impossible these days to be buried alive in a coffin. Although there's one story, I told this to Gianna Ratto earlier, about the hypochondriac. There was a hypochondriac who always thinks there's something wrong with him. When it was SARS, he was sure he had SARS. Had nothing at all. H1N1, went to see the doctor. I've got H1N1. No, you haven't. Get out of here. And one day this guy came into the doctor. And he said, no, I've got cancer, I've got cancer, I'm sure. And the doctor had enough of this hypochondriac. So he decided to scold him. He said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're perfectly healthy. It's all in your mind. Get out of here. And he really scolded him hard. And the hypochondriac was so stunned, he staggered out of the office. And being so unmindful, he walked right in front of a truck and got killed. And the doctor heard the sound of the truck hitting the guy and walked out and th saw he was responsible for killing this patient because he scolded him. And the doctor had a heart attack too. So because they died within minutes of each other, they were put in coffins and buried in the cemetery side by side. And after a day, the doctor heard a knock on his coffin. It was a hypochondriac. And the hypochondriac said, Doctor, have you got anything for worms? <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so now the chance of that happening is zero these days. Ajahn, I have faith in the Buddha and I used to take the Buddha image whenever I encountered problems in my life. However, sometimes I doubt whether Buddha will help to solve my problems because he heard me or I'm just talking to a statue. Is it really spirits and all those statues in temples? Thank you. No, they're just a statue. But it's what they represent. So if they, you see them and it's a very peaceful and inspiring statue that will give you its peace and inspiration. But there's no spirit inside those, te those statues. But the only way that Buddhism will help you is not by praying to the Buddha, but listening to the teachings of the Buddha, like what you've been hearing this evening. All you've heard this evening can help you, but the Buddha can't. Because that Buddha is just a piece of metal or a piece of plastic or a piece of wood. It's not the Buddha, but what it represents. It's the teachings of Buddhism. That's what will really help you. And the reason why many, many people are becoming Buddhist in Western countries is not because of the statues. It's because of the teachings. What they hear in uh, lectures such as this, what they read in books. Because not only does it make sense, it works. So if you have faith in the Buddha, then listen to some of the teachings of Buddhism and that will help you more than any statue will ever will. How to become a Sotapanna without attaining any jhana state? Thank you. Very difficult. Go the easy way. Look, how do you get to Perth without flying in an aircraft? <laughs> it is possible, you know, you can sort of you know, swim across to the mainland, you can cycle all the way down to Johor, you know, you can maybe get a, um, one of those jet skis to go across to Singapore, you may sort of walk across there and get a fishing boat from Singapore to Indonesia, oh look, come on, the easy way is the best way, so if jhanas are there, why not go the jhana way? 
How do you do walking meditation? You start, you walk, you stop. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> do you know how to walk? You know how to walk. So just be mindful of your walking, and that's called walking meditation. The great thing about walking meditation is that you choose a path and you go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. You don't get anywhere, which is the most wonderful thing about walking meditation. You do it just to be there rather than to go somewhere. So remember what I told you this morning, sort of all the still peaceful states, enlightenment itself is right where you are, right now. So you don't need to go anywhere, just be more fully where you already are. You can't close your eyes while walking, so how do you let go of the sight? You don't let go of the sight in walk, walking meditation. You just let go of all the past and the future, you let go of all the thinking, and you let go of being distracted so you can focus on the movement of your feet. But still keep looking. Usually you put your sight about two meters in front of you on the floor so you can actually see what's in front of you so you're not going to uh, trip over anything so you can see the wall at the end of the hall before it hits you. <laughs> Keep your eyes open. If we are the creator then we are responsible for the presence of war, prostitutes, global warming happening in the world. Is this correct? Someone is responsible. We always blame other people but we're the ones who elect the government, sometimes we're the ones who encourage all these things. Some of you men are the ones who go and visit the prostitutes. So maybe we are responsible more than we think. So certainly I think we should take a bit more responsibility rather than think it's always somebody else's fault. But I think that's going a bit too far. What I meant by creating, especially we create much of our world and we can actually do a lot to help change it. Dear Ajahn, when my friends or relatives do not listen to my advice and continue their ignorance and attachments, I usually feel angry when I see them suffer. Out of compassion I care for them but I suffer when they continue their ignorance. How do I balance my emotions? Thank you Ajahn for your advice in advance. When friends or relations do not listen to my advice, is your advice always good advice? Sometimes people don't listen to my advice. I've been teaching you all week. <laughs> and you're still not in Johnny, not following my advice. But do I get angry? Of course not. My advice to you, whoever wrote this, is don't give advice. Learn how to take it more. And also, don't get angry. So if you can follow that advice, if you can follow my advice not to get angry, <laughs> then maybe other people might follow your advice. <laughs> okay, next question. Ajahn, regarding the omega equals one theory, is, it, is enlightenment equals naught, if there is a possibility of making a reappearance after all the hard work of getting to enlightenment, if something can come out of nothing? That was the talk about um, creation and evolution, about the... Uh, the balance of positive energy and negative energy. We're talking about real physical energy, nothing spiritual in the universe. And as far as uh, certainly the professor of physics in the University of West Australia was telling me that the, uh, the ratio of positive and negative energy is one, and that's called omega in physics, which means that the universe can come out of nothing. Out of nothing we have positive energy and negative energy completely balancing each other. Therefore, one of the basic rules of science, the conservation of energy, is kept. It came out of nothing. There is some total of nothing here right now, so you can go back to nothing. And they say enlightenment is that nothing, the emptiness. So once you're enlightened, can you come back again? No other people can come back again, not you. You've done your job. Once you retire from work, do you want to go back to work again? And you've done your 30, 40 years, and you've got your pension. Who wants to go back to work when you've got a nice pension? So when you're enlightened, you've got your pension, you're out of here. <laughs> okay, another one, the popular movie 2010 showing the end of the world. Wow, this is 2000, that's next year. Is it 2010 or 2012 the world's going to end? Is it... 
two, I don't know, I don't watch these things. Is it, two, uh, is it 2012 or 2010? 12, okay. So they got this one wrong. But maybe this is true. <laughs> maybe this is an omen. 2010 is going to end. Next year. Whoa. So anyway, do you think the world will come to an end one day? No, the world won't come to an end to one day, but maybe you might come to an end one day. <laughs> Is karma basically about cause and effect and a corresponding reaction to every action? Please elaborate and lighten on this. That's a very nice way of understanding. Very much cause and effect. So karma is cause and effect. Without a god or a being interfering in that basic law. Can reincarnation and rebirth be scientifically proven? It has been scientifically proven. Just actually look at the word of prof work of Professor Ian Stevenson. I remember there was Ajahn Pamali, one of my monks in Perth. He downloaded from the internet a lecture by a famous United States philosopher, I think one of the greatest philosophers alive today. And he actually looked at Professor Ian Stevenson's work and said, look, anyone who's being rational, who's being scientific, has to look at that work and come to only one conclusion, that reincarnation has been proven. And if you really are rational about this, the evidence is so compelling, it amounts to a proof. And that comes from a great philosopher. Oh, don't forget his name. The only people who deny it's a proof are the people who just don't want to believe in it anyway. So it's there. If you don't believe me, you will soon. <laughs> when you die. <laughs> Buddha says there is no almighty God. Jesus Christ says he is the son of God. Prophet Muhammad says he is the messenger of God. So who is telling the truth? Please, Ajahn Brahm, clear this confusion. Thank you very much. Once there were these two monks, and they were arguing about reincarnation. Because one of them said, look, reincarnation, believing in reincarnation isn't necessary to become enlightened. Because it's all about the present moment. The past, who knows? The future, you know, it's uncertain. So Buddhism is all about the present moment, so reincarnation isn't necessary. And the other monk said, of course it's necessary. You now the Buddha taught about the problem of, of, like, of life and the whole idea of meditating is so you don't get reborn again, so you end reincarnation. Dependent origination, all these talks about the Buddha and his previous lives, of course the Buddha taught reincarnation. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. So he said, I'm going to go and see the teacher. So he went to see the, the master and he said, Master, look, it's all about the present moment, isn't it? The past, the future, you can't know. So reincarnation is not important. And the master listened and said, yeah, you've got a point there, you're right, you're right. So he went outside, the master said, I'm right. And the other monk said, he couldn't have said you're right. I'm going to go and see him myself. So he went to see the master and said, look, the Buddha taught his previous lives. You know, understanding the karma, understanding reincarnation is the first of the three knowledges you're supposed to get before you become enlightened. Without understanding reincarnation, you can't fully appreciate the first noble truth of suffering. It's vital. And the Master said, you've got a point. You're right. And so he went outside and said, the Master said, I'm right. He couldn't. He said, I'm right. No, he can't. He said, I'm right. We'll go in together. So they went in together, and the first monks said, no, this is what I said, this is what you said, you said I was right. And this is what he said, and this is what you said, you said he was right. We can't both be right. And the master said, you've got a point, that's right. <laughs> and the moral of that story is, depends from what angle you're coming from. So if you're coming from the Buddhist angle, there is no God. There's no sign of God. But if you come from a Christian angle, yeah, there is. But how can we actually mesh these all together? 
The only way you can mesh them all together is if you look at God not being a personal God, but a principle. So many actually Christians start moving away from like a creator, like a being who's a God, to some principle like truth, like love, like peace. So then, as a Buddhist, say, do you believe in the God which is love? Or peace or truth? So yeah, of course, we'll, we'll get into that one. So if it's an impersonal God, like truth, love, peace, do you believe in truth? Do you worship peace? Do you respect love? Then if that is what God is, yeah, fine. I'm with you. But if it's a person, a being, no. So that's a way that we can come together with actually modern Christians and modern Muslims by having something which is a principle rather than a being. Uh oh, I've got over many questions. Shall we go a bit further or? No, not really. Okay, so there are some more questions here. So if your question hasn't been answered, you may have to wait until your next life. <laughs> but no. I will try again tomorrow to answer some of these questions. So, <laughs> thank you for listening. And if I don't answer them all on this trip, the world isn't going to end in 2012. So there'll be plenty of time to answer all of your questions in the days and years to come. So thank you for listening. Now we can do the sharing of merits. Sukita hon tu yata yo Idamen yati nang ho tu Sukita hon tu yata yo Idamen yati nang ho tu Sukita Hon to yata yo Sadu 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 So very good night to everybody. The next talk tomorrow night, what's tomorrow night's talk called? Bringing Buddhism into the... Ah, bringing Buddhism into the 21st century. Tomorrow night, same time, same place. Good night.